Hello everyone, it's James Lindsay, and you are listening to the New Discourses podcast, and we are deep in the middle of our endless, interminable, unbelievably long series of critical education theory, or more formally, as it's known, critical pedagogy, which is why your kids can't read, and they're being turned into Marxists at schools. So as you know, if you're following the podcast, if you keep up with it, we're eyeballs deep in the middle of a very long Paulo Freire series, if you don't know who he is, because you're just stumbling in here. Paulo Freire is the Brazilian educator, uh, Marxist Brazilian educator, liberation theologian, which means a Marxist posing as a Catholic as well, who ruined South American education by making it Marxist. Then he was brought to the United States, his work and himself were brought to the United States, particularly by a Canadian-American education theorist by the name of Henry Giroux. In 1985, he really got his breakout. We're reading as part of a mini-series within this super-series, uh, through currently through Paulo Freire's book, The Politics of Education, which has a foreword by Henry Giroux, which is the book that Giroux was able to use to get Freire taken seriously in North American education colleges, which led to Paulo Freire's kind of magnum opus which is called uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed from 1970, becoming kind of the the central text of North American education. Uh, It's the third most cited book in the humanities and social sciences, third most cited work, I should say, not even just book. And it's at the heart of every college of education in North America. And it is literally just a Marxification of education, as we're going to hear as we go back into politics of education in the next episode. We're taking a break off of that series. Don't worry, we got lots more Freire coming. I'm going to go through the politics of education all the way. I'm going to go through the pedagogy of the oppressed. I might go through the pedagogy of hope. I don't know, which is also another book published in 1985 under Freire's name. We've got to understand Freire. Besides the fact Freire's opening up a lot for me to understand Marxism, because I think Freire got it and advanced the theory in a way that's crucial to understanding what's going on right now. So, we're going to spend a lot of time in Freire. If you want to understand why your kids can't read, why they can't do math at grade level, etc., it's because your kids go to Paulo Freire's schools. And this I say in similar fashion to when I say we all live in Herbert Marcuse's world, which is another point. I have lots of podcasts about Herbert Marcuse's world. And so you can go listen to those. But basically, we live in a world of repressive tolerance geared towards sustainability and toward a new kind of non-bureaucratic socialism that that Marcuse envisioned that could solve a number of problems, that the working class has become stabilized and so it's not a base for a revolution, that uh, capitalism somehow delivers the goods, but that the socialist model, as was playing out in the Soviet Union and China, could not deliver the goods. It was not actually able to get the production levels or the distribution levels up to be satisfactory. And so we live in Herbert Marcuse's world. He was a leading uh, neo-Marxist theorist or critical Marxist theorist of the 1960s. Freire actually bases a lot of his work off of Marcuse, although there are other influences as well, very notably including Antonio Gramsci. And as far as I can tell, although I haven't seen him cited specifically yet, uh, George Lukács, uh, who is a Hungarian Marxist. I'm reading these Freire books in parallel with Lukács' History and Class Consciousness, depending on what kind of mood I'm in and how deep I want to be, I read one or the other. Uh, and on any given day, and the parallels are striking. Uh, but anyway, we're not doing that today. <laughs> I want to do something that I frequently have to do. It's very frustrating. I feel like it reveals an insecurity in me. Maybe it does. But I want to give you proof. So something I keep saying is that culturally relevant teaching or responsive teaching or whatever these other brand names are, reproduce Paulo Freire's schools virtually identically. That's why I say all of your kids go to Paulo Freire's schools. So what we're going to do today is we're going to read through this paper that's in Reading Research Quarterly, Volume 41, Number 4, from October, November, December, 2006. So this is a journal, an academic journal article in Reading Research Quarterly, in other words, in Education Research. We're going to read through this, and I'm just going to draw out the Freirean thing. I'm not going to read through the whole paper. It's actually pretty long, and a lot of it's pretty detailed. It's a semi-empirical study like these people like to do, Um, and I don't really care about most of it. I want to read through the introduction and maybe kind of hit on a couple of points from near the beginning of the paper before they get into their experimental design and all of that, the kind of theoretical setup or the framing. And I want to show you 
So this paper in 2006, because remember, critical race theory is not in our schools, right? So this is a paper from 2006, shows you A, critical race theory is in the schools, and B, that we're dealing with a Freirean education model that's been readapted to the ideas of critical race theory and the other identity Marxist theories I keep discussing. So those include gender ideology, as it's called, queer theory, or sometimes gender studies, queer theory, uh, fat studies, disability studies, and the whole litany of all this made up crap, post-colonial theory, etc. And we did a good podcast here on new discourses recently, uh, titled something like uh, queer theory is gender Marxism, etc., where I go through how all of these different theories are actually just a reproduction of Marx's basic concepts, including Freire's critical pedagogy. And I think it's really going to show up, and I'll, that's what I want to highlight. So this is me being insecure. You can't People don't believe me. I get constant, James Lindsay doesn't know what he's talking about constantly. I'm not actually insecure. I know what I'm talking about. I'm totally confident that I'm correct. And that's why I keep plowing forward despite all of this. But I want to make it visible for you too. I want you to be able to see it as well. So we're going to go through the introduction to this paper titled Racial Literacy. Remember, critical race theory is not in our schools. It doesn't matter that Isaac Gotsman's book that we're kind of basing this whole series off of called The Critical Turn in Education. In other words, how our education system in North America became critical. In other words, Marxist. And he says this, the subtitle of that book is From Marxist Critique to Post-Structuralist Feminism, which means queer theory, by the way, that's where that came from, to critical theories of race. But critical race theory is not in our schools. All right, so this paper is titled Racial Literacy in a Second Grade Classroom. Critical Race Theory, Whiteness Studies, and Literacy Research. This paper in an education journal from 2006. The journal, again, is Reading Research Quarterly, Volume 41, Number 4, October, November, December 2006. Published by the International Reading Association. The title, again, this is by Rebecca Rogers and Melissa Mosley. Uh, they are both Oh, sorry, they're both in St. Louis, University of Missouri for Rebecca Rogers, Washington University in St. Louis for Melissa Mosley. The title of that paper, again, because critical race theory is not in our schools, from 2006, Racial Literacy in a Second Grade Classroom, Critical Race Theory, Whiteness Studies and Literacy Research. So we're talking about seven-year-olds. That's second grade in the United States. Kindergarten is five. First grade is six, seven-year-olds, racial literacy in seven-year-olds in their second grade classrooms using critical race theory, whiteness studies, and literacy to come together. Now, why am I focusing on this and what am I wanting to draw out here? One of the things I have to point out to you, if you have not been following the Freirean series from the politics of education that I've been doing, is that Paulo Freire one of his main little tricks, this is actually, I have another episode coming. It should probably be the next one after this, which we dive into the sixth chapter in two pieces of the politics of education. The first of those two pieces of chapter six, which is a workhorse chapter in that book, I'm going to title The Marxification of Education. And the argument I give, and you can dip back to the, uh, gen the previous podcast, which was the, um, gender Marxism, queer theory is gender Marxism, etc., you can dip back to that and hear that I say it's not that Paulo Freire brought Marxism, Marxism into education or that he turned education into a Marxist uh, a program for indoctrinating into Marxist theory. It's not that. He Marxified education itself. He made the idea of being educated into a form of bourgeois property. Okay? Which the Communist Manifesto says that the point of communism is the abolition of private property, by which he explains in that paragraph, he means bourgeois private property. So being educated, or more specifically, and actually Ferrari's own words, is being literate, is a form of bourgeois private property. So by extension, what you are literate in, the knowledge that you have also becomes a form of bourgeois private property. So it's not real. You're not really educated. You're formally educated in the existing system. You're not really literate. You've learned to read so that you can continue to reproduce the existing system without ever changing or challenging it when you learn to read according to what the existing society considers literate. So you need a revolutionary view of literacy that replaces literacy in terms of being able to actually read with literacy in terms of socio-political literacy that might also include sort of being able to read. 
Um, the point is that literacy becomes critical consciousness. Literacy means that you are literate to the society that you live in, in the correct way from Marxist from a Marxist perspective, which is to say the conscious way, which is to say the Marxist way, because otherwise you're becoming literate or formally educated in the existing system, which is just to say to reproduce the existing system. So he didn't bring Marxist theory. He didn't say, how do we make education deliver Marxist theory? He made education itself into a Marxist theory. He Marxified education. It's a completely different and deeper thing. And so the dialectic progresses, we would write if we were writing one of their books. So he Marxified education itself. The very notion of literacy becomes a site of Marxist division. The very site, uh, the very, very literacy itself becomes a dialectical dynamic between oppressor and oppressed with a falsely conscious ideological view of what it means to be literate that maintains the status quo in the existing society needing to be overturned by bringing in a new counter hegemonic. There's your Antonio Gramsci's approach view of what literacy means to change literacy over entirely in the schools. Therefore, are not merely indoctrinating into Marxist ideology. They are actually programming because their entire way of thinking, their entire theory of education, their entire theory of people, including children, is now Marxified. It is now the Marxist shape. Another one of his big programs is that he says that teachers and students, create that creates a dynamic, that creates a division, that creates a a stratification, a power stratification. And he says, no, we should be talking about educators and learners. And you'll hear more about this in the next two episodes, but especially the next episode when I get into chapter six of the politics of education. But he says that creates a dynamic, a power dynamic that has to be overthrown as well. We're going to shift from teachers who have power over students who are, and think with children, they're structuring the classroom ideally in age appropriate ways. So remember from the groomer school series that the goal that they explicitly said is that age appropriateness and childhood innocence are a doctrine that are used by the powers that be to continue to reinvent the same system. So we want to get rid of childhood innocence. We want to get rid of the boundaries in the structure. And what Freire says is that we get rid of teachers and students and replace them with educators and learners who are learners together. They are both subjects in the learning process and the learning process now and they, that they they are engaged, he says, in dialogue with one another. That's the method. The educator and the student are in dialogue with one another, he says, as equals. So again, adults and children as equals. You can see where the grooming comes in. And like I said, the next two episodes where we go through chapter six is going to make that really obvious. Um, the Marxification of education. And I think I'm going to call the other one the birth of groomer schools. And so this is these are some Freirian themes that are very obvious and very clear. And I'm going to read through a little bit of racial literacy in a second grade classroom, Clear, critical race theory, whiteness studies, and literacy research from 2006, because critical race theory is not in the schools, except apparently it was in second grade classrooms in 2006, at least according to these researchers in St. Louis, Missouri, because this is full, filled with data where they're checking what happens when you have those programs in classrooms in 2006. Like, do the math real quick. What was that, 16 years ago? So that said, let's just dive in, read through the beginning of this paper. I'll read the abstract. Actually, I haven't read the abstract because it's in a tiny print. I couldn't read it on my phone and the plane when I was coming home. Uh, it's in many, multiple languages, but here it says there's a pervasive silence in literacy research. Okay, then let's stop because what is one of Paulo Freire's? Remember, the point I'm trying to convey is we really, your kids really do go to Paulo Freire's schools. Okay. And so what does he talk about all the time is that the being uneducated or being illiterate creates a pervasive culture of silence. And it's not just silence because you can't read or write. You have to learn not just to be able to utter the word, he says, but to speak the word. And when you learn to speak the word, you proclaim the world and you're trapped in a culture of silence that's caused not by just being unable to read and write, but by being illiterate politically to your circumstances. You can't read your circumstances. He says, literally, you can't decodify your circumstances and understand how they produce oppression and then what to do about it to where you understand in the highest levels of class consciousness, what your role is in changing society into a Marxist utopia. And he, this, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not riffing. This is a very tight paraphrasing of Freire's point. 
So there's a culture of silence maintained by this Marxist view of what literacy means. And so the point is to awaken a critical consciousness so that you can speak the word and proclaim the world and therefore overcome the culture of silence. And so here we have in this abstract beginning, straight out of the literally the first five words or seven words, there is a pervasive silence in literacy research around matters of race, especially with both young people and white people. In this article, we illustrate that young white children can and do talk about race, racism, and anti-racism within the context of the literacy curriculum. Using a reconstructed framework for analyzing white talk, one that relies, and we'll come back to white talk, one that relies on literature and whiteness studies and critical race theory and draws on critical discourse analytic frameworks, we illustrate what talk around race sounds like for white second grade students and their teachers. So remember that seventh graders, or seven year olds, sorry, second graders, seven year olds. Okay, so now hold on. What's white talk? There's a very funny paper. I mean, I really think it's funny. I, I, could, I should read it just to show you how mentally ill these people are um, by a woman named Allison Bailey, who is a favorite hobby horse of mine because she's so kind of pious in the woke Marxist religion that she just blurts it all out, as many of the critical whiteness educators do. This paper that I'm talking about from Bailey is in like 2015. So white talk, this is 2006, obviously is an older idea. White talk is kind of the babble, as they put it, that white people engage in when they start to realize that they're being racist or being accused of racism. It's sort of a, a symptom of what later after this paper got called white fragility. Bailey would recognize it as a form of white fragility. So when you get caught out and somebody says something, don't you think that's kind of racist? And you kind of stumble around. You're like, well, I'm, I wouldn't say it's really racist. You know, I was just trying to say, and you kind of stumble and bumble around it. And I have a lot of black friends and my black friends seem to bubble. That's white talk. It's the kind of, um, I wanted to say reactive, but it's more like defensive babbling people do when they have been caught off guard by some Marxist manipulator, probably, and accused of racism or become aware of and uncomfortable in the fact that there's this weirdly racialized situation. And it's supposed to be a dead sign, A, that racism is present and being hidden, and B, that uh, the person knows it and is trying to cover it up. Okay, so it's like the way the white people talk when they're trying to cover up for the fact that they realize that they're racist and don't know what to do about it. Never mind that it could also have other diagnoses, like that the situation's now been made uncomfortable and nobody wants to be impolite or whatever. Um, there's no racism actually present, but a situation that wasn't necessarily racial got racialized. And everything. Anyway, they're, they're like this. So they're always looking for the magical under the surface diagnostic tools, which is exactly, exactly the Freirean point. This is what I keep coming back to for this paper. And this point is that you have a codified situation and the goal is to problematize it so you can decodify it. You're going to hear that in the next couple of episodes as we go through uh, chapter six of the politics of education. And I'm, I'm trying to tell you, I'm going to prime you for that, those, because you're going to understand it. But first, we're going to see it. We're going to understand it. I'm going to codify and decodify. <laughs> I'm going to follow his method, if you will. So he said, uh, so this abstract, I should say, these two women, they say, this research makes several contributions to the literature. Okay. We provide a detailed method for coding interactional data using critical discourse analysis and a lens from critical race theory and whiteness studies. Remember, this is second grade. And so, okay. We also illustrate the instability of racial identity formation and the implications for teachers and students when race is addressed in primary classrooms. Ultimately, we argue that racial literacy development, like the other literate process, in the classroom must be guided, of course, by conscious experts, by Gnostics. That was Freire's point too. We have to become conscious. That was Marx's idea. Heretofore, society has evolved kind of blindly, natural selection, and now the conscious, the people who understand the Marxist theory, the scientific Gnostics, who have the correct scientific study of history can take over. And when they take over, they can guide the direction of history consciously. So we can awaken a critical consciousness through education. And in the long run, when we have enough uh, critical consciousness, then we can guide the course of history itself. In other words, eugenics, because society makes man, makes society, makes man, makes society, makes man, is the general Marxist uh, ontology of mankind. I know those are a lot of big words, but that's the metaphysics. What does it mean to be a man? According to Karl Marx, 
man is that which makes society, and society in turn makes man by conditioning the range of his subjectivity, by creating social relations that structure the society he lives in and thus delimit his range of understanding. And then society, men can then change society that might evolve naturally, or the conscious can seize the means of production. For Marx, material conditions were what determined your consciousness, so you seize the means of material production. For these new neo-Marxists who are structuralist in their orientation and broad speaking, you seize the means of cultural structural production directly, like education. And then the conscious will guide the path of society, which makes a guided path for man, which makes a guided path for society in a kind of cycle so that man and society both become increasingly what Marx said was socialist, aware of being social, which they also called humanist, increasingly humanizing society and man and nature itself into a utopia that will eventually not need a state to do this anymore. According to Lenin, that occurs at the point when the state reaches its zenith, when you have the maximum amount of state power, then the state will magically wither away because it will become unnecessary. Okay, so now we'll dive in. That was the abstract. Let's pop into this paper and see what they say, and we're going to see Freyrian themes everywhere. Giroux is actually mentioned and quoted, if I recall correctly, but I don't. Freire is cited from the Pedagogy of Hope somewhere in the paper, but uh, it doesn't lean on him as much. So this brings up another point. This stuff, this way of thinking about the world, which is, you might say, a systemic way of thinking or a structural way of thinking, eventually gets in the water. You don't actually have to cite the people who did it. There's a great example we highlight in Cynical Theories, Helen and Pluckers and I did in Cynical Theories where Patricia Hill Collins wrote some landmark books in 90 and 93, Black Feminist Thought in particular, but also Intersectionality. And then her theory is blatantly heavily derived off of the postmodern thought of Michel Foucault. And then later, and we quote in Cynical Theories this being said, that it would be less intersectional to cite Michel Foucault after a black woman retooled his work more appropriately. And so you don't find it that many citations to Michel Foucault later. You find citations to Collins, and Foucault's ideas have been written out of this. We give another example uh, from Christy Dotson, if I recall correctly, and she's talking about something like epistemic violence, which was originally an idea that was from Michel Foucault, but she cites Gayatri Spivak, uh, a post-colonial theorist. And so you go back to that citation from Gayatri Spivak, which is a landmark 1988 paper, if I have the date right, called Can the Subaltern Speak? Very famous paper. And on every page, Spivak credits epistemic oppression and violence to Michel Foucault and his philosophy, but you don't see Christy Dotson do it. And so Michel Foucault, a white man, gets written out of his own theory. And this is so this stuff, in, was it intentional? Sometimes, obviously, we have that one quote, but then sometimes not because this stuff just gets in the water. And because it's a dialectical theory, the older modes are actually considered problematic. They've been problematized, so you can't platform them, platform them anymore. But the way of thought gets into the water that they drink, if you will, or the air that they breathe. And so they just think this way. And this is what they're doing to your kids. Your kids will never have to read a word of Paulo Freire, Karl Marx, George Lukács, any of these guys, Antonio Gramsci, Herbert Marcuse, and they don't have to read a word of it because they're not being taught, they're not being indoctrinated in their theory. They're being programmed to think that way. They're being programmed to create the dialectical opposition in every single situation. And they call that consciousness. They're being programmed to have a consciousness that puts everything into the master-slave dialectical relationship in one form or another to where, say, in education, they see being educated as just a vestige of the existing oppressive society. So they need a new definition for being educated. And we're going to, like I said, we'll hear more about this as we go through more of the politics of education. But let's just get into this um, pervasive science, how they're going to break the pervasive culture of silence and literacy around race. So as I told you before, though, culturally responsive, relevant, et cetera, teach, teaching, everything that's going on in schools now is just a identity Marxist remix of Paulo Freire's theory of education, which is Marxified education, which creates the Marxist dynamic, dialectical dynamic on ideas like literacy, education, being educated, and uh, 
um, knowledge itself, which ties in, l- latches on tightly. Why did postmodernism latch so tightly onto this? Because knowledge itself, the product of formal education, becomes a Marxist dynamic. The existing society produces a range of things that it believes are called knowledge and that people who believe those things are knowledgeable and they know things and they're experts and they reproduce the existing society, whereas everybody who's excluded with their other ways of knowing and their knowledges of their lived realities and lived experience are excluded from that so that you can't have a revolutionary moment. So knowledge itself becomes a Marxist dialectic, but that's exactly what Foucault was talking about. That's exactly what Foucault was discussing. So this grafts on very easily to the paper. Within social structures for freedom and justice, which means communism, literacy has always been deeply enmeshed with race. And they cite W.E.B. Du Bois from from 1903, for example, and lots of other people. When literacy education for African Americans ceased to be prohibited and punishable under state laws, literacy tests continued to function as a replacement of property as a means of preserving the rights of citizenship for whites. Now we have to stop. Property came up. This is the Marxist dynamic. Marxism in the tightest nutshell is there's a special kind of property. Some people give themselves access to it. They get the good life. They exclude everybody else from it. They get the bad life. So you have a stratification of society, an opp- a oppressor versus oppressed, privileged versus oppressed, bourgeoisie versus proletariat structure to society. These two are intrinsically an Uh, a class antagonistic situation because one is preserving the good life for themselves and excluding the other and exploiting them to be able to make, to make their way by doing so with Marx, the the proletariat did all the productive work with their hammers and sickles and the bourgeoisie wouldn't be able to eat if it wasn't for the fact or wouldn't have a building to live in if it wasn't for the fact that the working class was making all this stuff for them, but then they exploit those people to get what they want out of life without ever actually letting them into the good life. And so then the people on top create an ideology. That ideology for Marx was capitalism because the special kind of property was capital. In critical race theory, the special kind of property is whiteness, which they give themselves access to, and they exclude people of color from whiteness on a doctrine of white supremacy, an ideology of white supremacy. This Ideology creates a structure to society by creating social relations. It's structure how society works. For Marx, there was classism, the class divide, class antagonism. And for critical race theory, it is structural racism, which is just a reinvention of Marx's class antagonism using race. Okay, so property came up, but what is named as property? And what's happening here historically? So they say that literacy tests continue to function as a replacement of property. Now, this is just a historical point. So people will say, James, you're reading too much into this. No, the fuck I'm not. Sorry, I I swore again. I am not. I definitely am not. They are obsessed with property. Okay, so back in the day when the country, for example, was first founded, the only people who could vote were people who owned property. This is called aristocracy. This is what Marx identified as the third stage of history, feudal estates. So the only people who actually had political votes, the only people who actually counted as citizens in the real full sense... This coming over, this was a point Hegel was obsessed with, is the only people who were really citizens had certain things and they had certain responsibilities, but they were property owners. It was people who had property. And so the only people who could vote were people who held private property. So the only people who were politically enfranchised were property holders. This, of course, by the time Marx was writing, I don't know what was going on to be clear in Europe. My historical chops are catching up, but not great. I'm a mathematician. Uh, Damn it, Jim, I'm a mathematician. Um... But in the United States, we had already moved on from that. Uh, So they say now that literacy test, the idea was we're going to exclude black people from full suffrage. And this is a very long time ago. So literacy tests, being educated, became a form of specialized property that enabled certain people to be welcomed into full society and others to be excluded from it. It's the exact Marxist argument. So we, as I've argued before, they said that maybe we abolished slavery. Marx's history is uh, tribal communism, slave economy, aristocracy, capitalism, socialism, and then communism, the six stages of history. And I've argued before that critical race theory views it this way, and now we see it in literacy as well. 
And that's how you're going to link critical race theory into this literacy model. This is the, them building a bridge between these two Marxist ideas. And it was primitive, uh, anti-racist, everybody in the tribe is equal. So primitive equity followed by slavery, followed by a racial apartheid state segregation, followed by a colorblind equality, followed by racial equity enforced by an anti-racist department or dictatorship, followed by racial justice. That's the same six stages of history reproduced. And what we have here is there was a property-based, material conditions-based uh, aristocracy, and it shifted as we left that into capitalism into a racial property based. So what they're saying is we have to center race, not class. By taking up literacy tests that were designed, they claim, to exclude blacks in particular, which is probably largely true in some places at least, maybe everywhere, I don't know. Um, what they're making the argument is, is that we've shifted out of a material property and a racial property frame, and there's some kind of thing to being white, but it was being served, they gave you extra rights, but it was being serviced through hanging it on the idea of literacy as a property right. Literacy tests continued to function as a replacement of property as a means of preserving the rights of citizenship for whites. But whose idea was it that literacy is a Marxist dialectical dynamic? Paulo Freire. So we know that's where we're going and we see how we're going to link the race onto it. Okay, so following the civil rights legislation. So in our six stages, by the way, civil rights legislation marks the end of the racial aristocracy, segregation, Jim Crow, apartheid, and entrance into the colorblind equality tantamount to capitalism, fourth stage of history. So following the civil rights legislation, ongoing racial stratification of urban schools. So their argument is, of course, capitalism comes along, everybody's free, everybody has property rights, but unequal outcomes are still occurring. So it's actually not fair and the contradictions persist. So we have to have the conscious seize the means of production so we can move into an equal state, an administered equal state called socialism until it's a spontaneous equal state called communism. That's Marxism in a nutshell. So now we're reproducing this in this race using literacy as a proxy, using the Freirean and critical race theory models together, the fusing of these two together. So following the civil rights legislation, ongoing racial stratification, we have colorblind equality in the country now with the, written into the law, but we still have racial stratification. We don't have automatic racial equality, but actually more important, equity of urban schools. So now we're talking about, see, we have legal equality, but we're not getting equal outcomes. Ongoing racial stratification of urban schools and the accompanying political economy continue to deny children of color an equitable education. As a result, people of color have restricted access to the political, economic, and educational structures necessary to gain equitable outcomes in society. So if you are paying any attention, you now understand that all we're doing is the Marxist scientific study of history, the Wissenschaftlicher Sozialismus, we're just reproducing that with literacy as the special property now. Okay? As a result, people of color, so we're hanging, we're, we're using the strong correlation between race and maybe even some intentional issues of racism connected to it in order to connect race and literacy the same way that they connect race and class so that they can, as Gloria Ladson Billings put it, make race the central construct for understanding inequality, which is the heartbeat of critical race theory. And what they mean is to understand it through a Marxist lens and a Marxist analysis. And so now we see the recreation of the Marxist analysis of history. As a result, people of color have restricted access to the political, economic, and educational structures necessary to gain equitable outcomes in society. So the outcomes are the measurement, equal outcomes. So what do they want to install? They're saying colorblind equality came along, equitable outcomes don't happen, the contradictions persist, so we need an enlightened, as we heard in the abstract, anti-racist vanguard who's going to come in, set up a system that's going to enforce equitable outcomes over and over and over again until that becomes spontaneous. We need the racial equivalent of socialism, which they call racial equity, until it becomes spontaneous, at which point we'll finally have the racial equivalent of communism, which is racial justice. This social stratification helped to construct literacy education in the U.S. immigration, as well as in the policy and practices of schools, as a right for white children and a privilege for children of color. So this is this is how they're going to undermine the idea of rights. And they see where they're saying, as they, there's an ideology now that's constructing this as a right for whites 
as part of their whiteness and as a privilege, something granted by the power structure, by the whites. If you want to be a person of color and come to a good school, it has a privilege that you get to do that. It's a right for white kids, but it's a privilege for you. That's the, that's the crappy argument that they make. And they're just reproducing the Marxist analysis of history in another domain. As Ladson Billings, 2003, asserted, so there's our Gloria Ladson Billings, but not the same paper, uh, any of the two papers that I've really detailed here. From a critical race theory perspective, literacy represents a form of property. Could it be more explicit? There's your Freyerian hypothesis. Gloria Ladson Billings walks around acting like she's some kind of hot, hot shot, smart lady. She's just plagiarized Paulo Freire. And if she's been working in Marxist education circles, eh, duh, of course she did, because she would be very familiar with it. And do you see Paulo Freire cited here? <laughs> no, you don't. You see him written out of his own theory. I have uncovered very, very clearly how Paulo Freire has reconstructed literacy. And like I said, you're going to hear that, especially in the next two episodes of the podcast, which by the way, I've already recorded them. Um, but I want to put this out first. So as Ladson Billings asserted from a critical race theory perspective, literacy represents a form of property. And I already uncovered that that's exactly what Freire did in his sort of difficult way to read what he's making. And Ladson Billings, who, by the way, I wrote the original paper on A, critical race theory and education in 1995, because it's not in schools, and B, culturally responsive education, or maybe it was relevant. I don't, I don't know that there's any significant difference in 1995 as well, the same year. So in 2003, eight years later, she asserts from a critical race theory perspective, literacy represents a form of property. And in this paper, we already see how that's now been linked. Remember, this is about second graders. That's already been linked to uh, race. Literacy and race have been tied together in this opening paragraph, one being a proxy for another, the same way that they make race a proxy for education, or sorry, for, for economic status, and then make it, as Lad, Gloria Ladson Billings herself said, race is the central construct for understanding all inequality. That is the point of critical race theory. That's the heartbeat of critical race theory. So now we have black and white, as black and white as it can get. Literacy represents a form of property. Communist Manifesto, Chapter 2. All of communism can be summarized in a single sentence. Abolish private property. And he actually says abolition of private property, which is not a sentence. He goes on, quoting Ladson Billings, it is, quote, property that was traditionally owned and used by whites in the society. Take out white, put in bourgeois. It is property that is was traditionally owned and used by the bourgeoisie in society. Derp. Derp. To what? I, why? To, I didn't go look up Ladson Billings 2003, but I bet you I can tell you why if she actually explains why. It wasn't just traditionally owned and used by whites or the bourgeoisie in society. It was used by whites to maintain, as this paragraph is already laid out, to maintain their privileged position and to exclude people of color or the proletariat or whatever from their position of privilege so that they can continue to be exploited, alienated, and estranged in the various ways that Marx uses that and various weird ideologies to justify that, like this is what literacy actually means, are brought to fore. And so what is critical or sorry, culturally relevant or responsive teaching supposed to do? Well, we're going to make it a cultural teaching that reproduces Freire's generative words concept so that we can then bring in other ways of knowing and make it more relevant and engaging. That way it doesn't just reproduce whiteness and enforce whiteness onto people of color, which alienates them from their racial identity. Da, 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 da. It's just Marxism, guys. Guinier, I don't know how to pronounce that name actually, 2004, I'd have to look that up, argued, for, uh, argued the need for racial literacy, really kind of like Freire's political literacy, which requires us to, quote, rethink race as an instrument of social, geographic, and economic control. I have to do a couple pages of both whites and blacks. Racial literacy offers a more dynamic framework for understanding American racism, end quote. A racially literate person, according to Gunier 2003, uses, quote, race as a diagnostic device, an analytic tool an instrument of process. Okay, what does Freire say? <laughs> well, he says adult, the, the chapter six that I'm going to do two podcasts on soon, or I've actually done two podcasts on since you'll hear soon, is the adult literacy process 
as a uh, something of freedom. I'd have to look that up again. The adult literacy process as basically a pathway to freedom. Actually, I have it right here so I can, I can look in the table of contents. Uh, the adult literacy process as cultural action for freedom. That's okay. Process. The social worker's role in the process of change. That's chapter five. That's the previous podcast on Freire. The adult literacy process as cultural action for freedom. So what do we read here? These idiots just plagiarized Paulo Freire and made it about race and wrote him out of his own theory. So all this has has happened. Okay. Uses race as a diagnostic device, an analytical tool, and an instrument of process. Process for freedom. The adult literacy process. Right? The adult literacy process as cultural action for freedom. What the hell do you think they're doing with racial literacy? The racial literacy process as cultural action for freedom. Right. And what were the exact first words of this stupid thing? And I said, well, it's communism, like under my breath. Right. Within social struggles for freedom and justice. So now we're talking about racial literacy. (laughs) So stupid. It's just so ripped off. There's only like two ideas in Marxism. So they have to keep saying the same thing in thousands of different new words. So now we have the goal is for freedom. Literacy is the property. And race as a diagnostic device, an analytical tool, and an instrument of a process for freedom. Cultural action. Why racial literacy? For cultural action. What's the cultural action going to be? For freedom. So now we're going to make racial literacy process as cultural action for freedom. That's chapter six of Paula Freire's Politics of Education, which is not cited in this paper at all. This book, Paula Freire is, but not this, not this book. They have ripped off Paulo Freire, retooled him to make race the central construct of all inequality, and then written him out. They mention him like he's this kind of thing in the background, this super important background character, but no, now it's all them, these narcissistic grifters. Okay, so what? carrying on, that was the end of the Gunier, I don't know, G-U-I-N-I-E-R uh, quote from 2003. They carry on in the paper, first, racial literacy defines racism as a structural problem. That's Freire's whole point. (laughs) We'll hear this again. We've already heard it in the Freire podcast, but you're going to hear it again in the first half of chapter six and the second half of chapter six. First, racial literacy defines racism as a structural problem rather than as an individual one. So the society decides that we're going to have literate people and those people are going to have access to different levels of society. And by caring about literacy and wanting literacy, it actually makes illiterate the people who can't read. They weren't illiterate until literacy mattered. So society made them illiterate. So it's a structural problem that requires them to be awakened to this structural dynamic that literacy itself was the problem that marginalized them. In fact, Freire argues it moved them from center to margin. Just a cheap reproduction of Freire here. Second, racial literacy. Think about what that means. Reading race. Remember, this is second graders. Second, second, racial literacy locates debates about about public process, which are often cloaked in the subtext of race. Cloaked in the subtext. With an explicitly democratic context that's forward-looking. Remember, democratic means communist. Everybody has to be equal. Everybody has equal voice. This is where Ferrari is saying that there's going to be a dialogue between educators and students, uh, educators and learners as equals. And this is what Giroux took off and ran with and talks about. So Giroux is Henry Giroux is a link from Ferrari forward. This is where Henry Giroux takes off and talks about again and again and again. And I mean it again and again and again. Read his books. It's creepy. Go find one of his books and keyword search the word democratic. Democratic education, democratic education, democratic education, where the students and teachers, I should say, sorry, educators and learners are as equals, which was Freire's idea with an an explicitly democratic context that is forward looking, utopian, as a matter of fact, according to Freire. Third, the process dimension to racial literacy can be used to guide participatory problem solving. In other words, this is again, Freire, the idea is to make it activist. Your point of education is to awaken the consciousness and get people to start doing social activism so that they can speak the word, that's the literacy, and proclaim the world. That's the activism. Gunier, 2003, wrote, quote, in order to change the way race is understood, race has to be directly addressed rather than ignored. Of course, this is some stupid caricature of what colorblind equality is, that we're ignoring race. 
which isn't true. It's just like capitalism is a caricature of a free market. Um, their idea of what colorblindness means is a caricature of what colorblindness means. It means racial equality before the law and a um, pretty strong distaste for racial stereotyping to realize that racial stereotyping is very unfair to every individual. So what it actually means is treating individuals as individuals. That's what colorblindness actually means. We're not, we're not going to judge you based, we're not going to prejudge you, especially based on who you happen to be. We're going to get to know you for the content of your character, the output of your merit, and the application of your talents. That's colorblindness. And they create this caricature where race is ignored. They create a caricature. Exactly like Marxism, create old school Marxism, creates a caricature of a free market economy based on private property rights that boils down to cronyism and people not paying for his bills. Literacy education in schools, they, they, they tell us, notice though, this is just a cheap reproduction of Marxism and Freire in particular. Literacy education in schools must address race, racism, and anti-racism in an educative manner to prepare children to participate in U.S. democracy. So we can't have political change if we don't teach racial literacy as a process for cultural action, for change, for freedom. What was it from Freire, the social worker? Uh, it's the social worker's role in the process of change. That's chapter five. Chapter six, the adult literacy process is a cultural action for freedom or of freedom. Okay. Now we have literacy education in schools, which is going to be racial literacy, is going to be required, must address race, racism, and anti-racism in an educative manner to prepare children to participate in U.S. democracy. Remember, U.S. democracy is not real democracy, true democracy, until first it's proletarian democracy, the socialist equivalent, where it's fake, where only the party has any power because they're the enlightened ones, and then eventually everybody is as equals. And so true democracy emerges on the other side of proletarian democracy. But right now we have bourgeois democracy. That's Lenin. Lenin says what the West calls democracy is bourgeois democracy. We need proletarian democracy where the only people who have voice are the party, aka a dictatorship by the party. And eventually the party will wither away because it's unnecessary because everybody will be the party. Then we'll have true democracy when everybody's truly equal. However, we're told, as Green and Abbott Perkins, 2003, have pointed out, there is a noticeable silence in literacy research and teaching around issues of race, racism, and anti-racism. Culture of silence. Freire. Every sentence, guys. Conversations about race and literacy research are framed in the language of diversity, multicultural education, culturally relevant education, and multiliteracies. And so now you're just hearing brand names for which all this same Marxist package are being sold. These are different boxes. Like, imagine the same garbage. It's funny because communist countries don't have chocolate. But imagine the same garbage chocolate or whatever, or bread that's 80% sawdust or whatever, 40% sawdust, whatever it is. And then you put it in different boxes. And the boxes look like they have different wrappers. One's a pink box, one's a blue box, one's a green box, one's a red box, one's a black box. And man, don't they look nice? Black box with gold ribbon, red box with green ribbon. Don't they look nice? Conversations about race and literacy research are framed in the language of diversity. Okay, that's a problem then. Multicultural education, that's a problem then. Culturally relevant education, I already told you this is a direct reproduction of Freire, definitely a problem then. And multi literacies, they love multi everything because the more complex it is, the more guru they get to be. And they get to pretend it's really complicated. And only these geniuses, who apparently can only rip off previous writing, because Freire just repackaged Lukács, Lukács just repackaged Marx. And then these idiots just repackaged Freire and then pretended they didn't. They're idiots. They're idiots. They're very strategic and they never freaking stop and they're zealots. But they're idiots. They don't have any original ideas. None of the, the Marx maybe has some original ideas, but he was kind of repackaging Hegel. And Hegel was repackaging, Hegel probably did have some original ideas, but he was ripping off of Rousseau. Maybe Rousseau actually was creative. There hasn't been any creativity on the left since the dialectic came into prominence, though. They all just reproduce this exact same garbage in lots of words in some new domain, and it 
surprisingly takes them decades to figure it out. Like if these people are actually smart, Marx would have laid this stuff out in 1848 with the Communist Manifesto. And by 1850, you would have had the race version, the sex version, the gender, you would have had everything. All of them, everywhere you could imagine a power dynamic, you would have had direct reproduction. No, it took them a freaking century and a half. They're not smart. They can't generalize. I mean, it's my mathematician flex, but they can't generalize for shit. And that's why these idiot, very smart people can't see it. They're like, no, Marxism is about edu- it's about economics. You could do it. No, you stupid idiots. You can't generalize. You can't generalize for one second. You make fun of my PhD thesis. You make fun of it. But it's a broad generalization of a whole bunch of stuff that people on the surface would say are very different. And they're not. You can't generalize. That's your problem. That's why these idiots take 150 years to come up with something you could come up with literally in about three weeks if you knew what it like. If you actually understood Marxist thought as a starting point, you could recreate all of these theories, not all the pages of writing, all the ideas, the core essence of them in about a week. It's really that stupid. It's unbelievable that it keeps tricking people. It's unbelievable how many people with PhDs in philosophy and stuff literally can't see it. They're looking at the economic tree and they're like, I'm not in a forest. So stupid. Anyway, sorry, that was my rant. Multicultural educators observed that white teachers can engage with multicultural education without ever having to interrogate the ways that white people are the beneficiaries of inequality in society. Indeed, Ladson Billings, 2003, pointed out that in classrooms, even when teachers use children's books that explicitly children's books that explicitly deal with the matters with matters of race and racism, they do not talk about race. This may be because of a lack of critical analysis of classroom discourse around these matters. So this is where Freire is saying even when something like a relevant concept comes up in literacy education, instead of just disjointed syllables and silly examples of practice sentences that that teach people to read, like hooked on phonics, like C, C Dick, C Jane, C Dick run, C Jane run, C Dick and Jane run, uh, sound out the words, kids. Those are all meaningless sentences, according to Freire. So maybe though, you know, C, you could say C Dick, he is white, C Jane, she is black, C Dick and Jane hanging out together or whatever, you know, now it's, engage it, it's mentioned race it's brought up race but they don't talk about race they're not going to talk about the racial they're not going to make it about racial political literacy like all of the whiteness studies people say is that every racial interaction has to be done authentically which means that it has to be completely about all of this it has to be the politically active version of everything all the way i don't know if you just heard that rumble but i think we had an earthquake um carrying on this may be because of the lack of critical analysis and classroom discourse around these matters. So making things, not bringing up crap that doesn't matter, that's divisive, that's a problem, that's Marxist. They don't know why people wouldn't do that. Why wouldn't you politicize everything all the time? Why wouldn't you make it about the politics? Why wouldn't you make the education program, which is about learning to read or do math, why wouldn't you make that about learning racial politics? Why didn't you do that? They don't have the slightest idea. And they say it may be because of a lack of Marxism critical analysis, and classroom discourse around these matters. It's that we didn't bring the religion in yet, of course. Therefore, a deeper exploration of the ensnarement of race, literacy, and whiteness is in order. That's all they do. We have to talk about this on our terms because we're obsessive about it. Our research and pedagogy, they say, are situated, they love that, within two complementary literacy frameworks that offer reconciliation between accelerative and critical approaches to literacy education. For example, Dossier, Johnson, and Rogers, 2005. Didn't see Paulo Freire here, but it's funny how he comes up in literally every sentence. We refer to this approach as teaching for literacy acceleration within a critical framework. Oh, wow. We need a reconciliation between accelerative, which whatever that means, probably means accelerating the existing uh, system and critical, which means tearing down the existing system approaches. So we're going to reconcile them by creating exactly what these idiot Marxists do all the time, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And what is the synthesis? It's take the two things and put a hyphen between them. <laughs> That's basically what it boils down to. You don't have, we have teachers and students. Paulo Freire says we need teacher students and student teachers. And later, that was in, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. By the time he gets to uh, politics of education, he says we need educators and learners. They come up with new words that hide that stupid hyphen. You just mix two ideas that don't go together and hyphenate them. Literally, this is what they do, right? And so now what we have is 
We refer to this approach as teaching for literacy acceleration within a critical framework. Okay, <laughs> we're just going to do it within that, which is what they do all the time. What did they do uh, with critical constructivism, which is the formal name for woke, for woke Marxism, critical constructivism. It's the fusion of critical theory and postmodern social constructivism, and which is actually just a advanced accelerated derivative off of Marxist social constructivism. So what in the world did they do? Well, they said, well, we're going to do the postmodern deconstruction, but we're going to bring in the idea that race was imposed. So we're going to add, we're going to just put the critical into the constructivism. Okay, so now it's not social constructivism, which would tear down our ability to say that there are these stratifications because the categories would be blurred out of existence, would be deconstructed out of existence. And that would be not good for being able to do a critical theory to awaken a proletariat to create, as Kimberly Crenshaw called it, a meaningful politic of identity and an anchor for subjectivity of the oppressed masses. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're just going to put them together. Now we're going to get rid of social constructivism, say it's problematic, create critical constructivism by just hammering these two things together, even though they technically don't go together. The deconstructive approach is going to deconstruct everything except this thing, which is different because it's imposed, because there's a secret power dynamic that works like a pagan god making it happen. This is all they ever do. So now we're going to fuse these two approaches to education and we're going to call it literacy acceleration within a critical framework. <laughs> Same trick, different day. Critical frameworks which attend to matters of social justice do not often attend to the details of teaching for acceleration. Then give some examples of four exceptions. See one, two, three, four, five, six different other papers. So apparently they do. They don't, but apparently they do. For exception, see lots of things. Teaching for literacy acceleration, a set of approaches that uh, focus on developing flexible strategic reading and writing in student, uh, students' zone of proximal development, does not often attend to matters of power, justice, and race. So we recall to a, uh, respond to a call by Nieto in 2003. I'll go, hang on a second before we go to that part. Teaching for literacy acceleration. In other words, so literacy acceleration, they describe as a set of approaches that focus on developing flexible strategic reading and writing in, stu in students' zone. There's got to be a typo there of proximal development. Proximal means near, close to, close to where you are. Okay, so like your shoulder is proximal to your elbow uh, in comparison because it's closer to your core, to your body, right? And your elbow, I should say your elbow is distal to your shoulder, your wrist is distal to your elbow, and your fingertips are distal to your wrist. And the opposite of that is proximal. So your wrist is more proximal than your fingertips, your elbow is more proximal than your wrist, your shoulder is more proximal than your uh, elbow. Okay, so that's what that word means. And so get really close to where the kids already are, and then build on that to accelerate their flexibility of their reading and writing skills. I don't know if this is a good approach to reading and writing or not, but I'm going to say that they're saying the problem with it is that it often does not attend to matters of power, justice, and race. That just like Freire says, if we actually teach people to read through syllables, phonics, etc., practice sentences, then we're going to ignore the fact of their political conditions. We're going to ignore the context in which they are embedded, which has to be the real focus. So we respond to a call by Nieto, who probably just stole it from Freire, if I had to guess, quote, racism is a problem that must be confronted in research, in classroom practice, in the assumption and beliefs that researchers and teachers have about the intelligence and capabilities of children of color, and even in the very way we understand literacy. So they project out the fact that they think black kids are stupid, where most people don't do that, they project that outward and then say, these are the, these are assumptions that people have, like who, like you, that's who have about the intelligence and capability of children of color. Now, where in the world did that come from? I'll give you three guesses besides the projection. I'll give you three guesses. Just kidding. You only need one. It's Paulo Freire, which we're going to hear again as we go through chapter six in the coming podcasts. So listen for it when we get there. Again and again and again, we've already heard it throughout some of the book, but we're going to hear it brought up explicitly in the chapter six, um, that the formally educated believe that the peasants are stupid, that they have insufficient intelligence and capabilities. We've already heard that there's these models, the nutritionist model of education, he puts it, where the goal is to come in and feed the illiterate, 
the words so that they can be nourished to be able to participate in the existing society. The banking model of education where the literate are going to deposit words into and ideas and skills into the peasants, the illiterate, so that they can become functional in the existing society and capitalize upon the investment placed into them as though they were bank accounts that are empty and to be filled up. The illiterate as the empty man is literally a section in chapter six of the politics of education. Okay. We have the, he, he, in early on in the book, he says that it creates this messianic savior model of education that the, the poor illiterate needs to be saved from his illiteracy. So they go around scouring the edges of the cities and towns to find illiterates and to save them from their illiteracy by bringing them into, uh, the, the, the heaven state of being literate. And it's all he says, it's, this is like reading Ibram Kendi, who's like, people believe all these bad things about black people that most people just don't believe. And he's like, all white people believe this. And so, unless they're anti-racist, of course. And so now we see it again. The assumptions and beliefs that researchers and teachers have about the intelligence and capabilities of children of color. Who? You. That's who. So the projection happens, but this is just a reflection off of exactly the thing Freire said about the way that formal educators look at the illiterate is that, oh, well, they're incapable. Oh, well, they're stupid. Oh, well, they're hillbillies. Oh, whatever it happens to be. Just a reproduction of Freire again. And that was, of course, the point that I was trying to convey that this paper for second graders using critical race theory and whiteness studies explicitly in literacy education of second graders to create racial literacy is just a reproduction of Paulo Freire. This is, Paulo Freire is extremely relevant and your kids go to Paulo Freire schools. Carrying on, a combined framework can provide a useful set of designs for guiding the reading of race, drawing on the commonalities of critical and accelerative learning, or sorry, literacy processes. In this article, we carry out a multi-layered analysis because the more complex it is, the more guru status, consultant status they have. Oh, it's so complex. You have to hire me as a consultant to make it clear. Don't trust that. Don't trust consultants. Using a critical discourse analysis, CDA, which we used a lot in our bullshit uh, grievance studies papers to conclude whatever we wanted, within the ethnographic context of a second grade public school classroom in the Midwestern United States, since they're both from Missouri, I'm assuming this was in Missouri, which means I assume that critical race theory was being taught and experimented with in Missouri classrooms in 2006 and before to write this paper. So we carry out a multi-layered analysis using critical discourse analysis. Sounds fancy, but isn't. It's just making up critical theory onto whatever you happen to have read. And it, so you're, you're, you're analyzing the discourses, what's said, how it's said, why it's said, when it's said. And you're just going to use critical theory to analyze what you said to find the hidden racism or the hidden sexism or the hidden classism or whatever. That's all it really is. So the example we had in our grievance studies paper, one that was critical discourse analysis, is we pretended we went to Hooters like a thousand times, some absurd number of times, recorded all the conversations, and we cherry picked out where something problematic to women was said and said that this Hooters is a reproducer of gigantic sexism. And then the editor of the journal, which was Sex Rolls, which is a big journal, um, wrote back, I've never been to one of those places, but I, and I, but I knew it was bad, but this is so much worse than I actually thought. So I just, she's never been, she has no idea. And I just confirmed her prejudices that she had by playing into them by allegedly and explicitly cherry picking examples using critical discourse analysis as the tool to do it. So it sounds fancy, but really what it is, is digging around in the way people talk and interact uh, in order to come to the conclusion you started with. That's what it is. And the problem, uh, the conclusion is whatever the critical theory says should be there is going to be there. So uh, petitio principi is violated again. They've assumed from the outset what's going to be there. And then they found it. Like I've told you, critical. it's all critical race theory does. Uh, Kendi's razor. That's exactly like Occam's razor. But the answer is always racism. You know, the, ra the racist uh, Occam's razor is that the most parsimonious explanation is probably correct. Kendi's razor says, the most racist explanation is probably correct. So a multi-layered analysis sounds so fancy. Using critical discourse analysis sounds so fancy. Within the ethnographic context sounds so fancy, which means they stared at and wrote it down like a story. Of a, They wrote the story of what they were viewing of a second grade public school classroom in the Midwestern United States to inquire how students' literate positions are acquired and constructed 
through the lenses of whiteness and race. So how how their literate positions, how literate are they analyzed through this Marxification of what literacy means? So where is their now relational privilege to the power structure created by the idea of literacy itself? That's what that means. Where are they in the Marxist hierarchy of the literate versus illiterate stratification of society? And how is that actually acquired and constructed through the lenses of whiteness and race? Which means whiteness and race means they're going to use critical race theory as race Marxism to analyze literacy status. And you're, so you get these two Marxist theories, critical pedagogy and critical race theory. One of the idea of literacy, education, and knowledge. One of um, whiteness versus exclusion from whiteness or people of color, two Marxist theories. And all they're going to do is hammer them together until they're made into some weird alloy. That's what's happening. As a universe, so Marxism all the way down, Freire reproduced. As a university, it's, it's exactly what I told you about culturally relevant teaching like 5,000 times in the Freire podcasts, by the way. It is, it is that they figured out a way to repackage the exact same ideas that Freire in education under identity Marxist or race Marxist identity politics. That's all it is. And this is them hammering it together to create some goofy alloy um, that allegedly is is synthetic. So it's allegedly stronger than both, but it's actually weaker than both and is going to fall apart. As a university researcher and second grade teacher, both white. Oh, what? First of all, how are you both A, but never mind you're, you're as a second grade teacher who doesn't know basic grammar. Both white. What a friggin' surprise. What a friggin' surprise. Let me just read that again because it's really funny that they're second grade teachers and their grammar is wrong. As a university researcher and second grade teacher. Oh, wait, it's two people. I get it. So one's a university researcher and one's a teacher. I got it. Never mind. I thought they were both, they were describing themselves. Both white. What a surprise. You're both white. We collaboratively designed and carried out this research, alternating teaching and research responsibilities. Oh, how collaborative. We brought the construction of race to the surface through the ongoing project of teaching for literacy acceleration within a unit on African American history, specifically focusing on the civil rights movement in the United States within the context of literacy instruction on second graders. The central research question that guided this analysis was, quote, in what ways do white students and their white teachers take up race in the literacy curriculum? In other words, how are they going to do it? in the Marxist, race Marxist way. So how are they going to make it like political, super hardcore political? So I don't want to do too much more. This was the idea, but I want to give you, I'm going to dip into the theoretical frameworks, critical race theory and whiteness studies. They, these are the things that they're going to say. Critical race theory, CRT is an intellectual. So it's explicitly there, 2006 in the classroom. They just said it's in the classroom. They just said it's in the classroom and civil rights history instruction in second grade classes in 2006 in Missouri. Maybe Illinois. I know it's right on the border. I don't know. Critical race theory and whiteness studies are explicitly there. And then they explain it. Critical race theory, CRT, is an intellectual tradition (laughs) derived from a set of frameworks from critical legal studies, Bell 1992, Delgado and Stefanczyk 2001, Gunier 2003 and 4, Ladson Billings and Tate 1995, Matsuda, Lawrence, Delgado and Crenshaw 1993. All the names we're getting used to now. Critical race theory recognizes racism as an enduring and pervasive part of life in the United States and works toward eliminating racial oppression as part of the broader goal of ending all forms of oppression. In other words, it's neo-Marxist. For a summary of the tenets of CRT, see Matsuda, etc., 1993. Dixon and Rousseau, 2005, argued that the constructs outlined in CRT scholarship and the law have yet to uh, be used to their full potential in education. They're already being used, but not to their full potential by 2005. For example, some scholars have examined whiteness as a construct of privilege, but not as an idea that manifests and affects schooling in tangible ways, such as setting standards for normal and acceptable actions. Okay, so they set themselves up as white people set themselves up as a default, create an ideology called white supremacy to see themselves as the default inheritors of the better part of society where everybody else is abject other that's exploited and excluded, etc. Marxism. Now, there's another subtle Marxism here, though. You got to understand this is a key, very important word and idea. Some scholars have examined whiteness as a construct of privilege. What does that mean? Having access to the special property of society. Whiteness as a construct of privilege. Having access to bourgeois property in society, bourgeois racial property here. 
Okay, so it's just a recreation of Marxism. Privilege means having access to the bourgeois property that Marxists obsess about. Race Marxists obsess about racial bourgeois property because they covet it. Actual Marxists covet gold, wealth. And so they obsess about bourgeois private property, capital, that they want. Okay. Thus, whereas the examination of whiteness and whiteness as a function of racism is central to a CRT analysis, white scholars in education have not fully examined the material effects of whiteness and how whiteness is deployed, material effects of whiteness, and how whiteness is deployed and maintained materially as an aspect of property again and again and again with the Marxism Okay, so then details whiteness studies. I won't read through all of this because it's slightly annoying. Uh, I'm just kind of giving an overview now. Whiteness studies are related to the intellectual movement of CRT, which, of course, we're hearing on TV these days that it's not true, and seek to theorize and problematize the construction of whiteness as an absent racial category and dominant social norm as a form of bourgeois property. In other words, the majority of whiteness scholars agree that whiteness is connected to institutionalized power and priv privileges that benefit white Americans. And here we have the citation of Henry Giroux, for example. Whiteness has been defined in many ways, including the social distance from blackness and a cultural practice that constructs race-based hierarchies. Of course, a complete understanding of domination must include an analysis of the fabric of oppression the structure of society created by the structural dynamic between whiteness and those excluded from it, right? Which includes the ways that racism, classism, sexism, ableism, and heterosexism intersect. Intersectionality. So then, some different views of what whiteness is. Um, whiteness inevitably means racism, they say, for some people. Other scholars argue for a view of whiteness that includes a positive theorization of what whiteness can mean, including a more fully developed notion of whiteness that includes the idea of white allies. White privilege, the way that white people benefit from a racist society, because it's the racial bourgeoisie, refers to unearned advantages that are based solely on skin color and sometimes unnoticed by white people. For example, if parents never have to wonder about whether their children will see themselves in the books they read in the class, or if their children's grades were based on the color of their skin, these parents are privileged by whiteness. Well, are they not privileged by your critical race theory then? Because we have to wonder that now, don't we? As white people, because of critical race theory. Da 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 da. Okay. What seems to be agreed upon is that whiteness is neither inherently good nor inherently bad. Rather, whiteness is a social construct, which means a political construct, which means it is the bourgeois property that must be abolished. The construction of whiteness is the next section. A complex range of discursive, psychological, economic, and political structures holds racism in place. Why don't you just say ideology? Because that's what you mean. Because then it would be more obviously Marxist. Thus, understanding the construction of whiteness means attending to each of these frameworks. Psychological. There's your SEL, baby. Each of which assumes that race is socially constructed through ideologies and institutions. In this research, we privilege the discursive framework, but at the same time argue that the discursive framework is rooted in materialist and psychological frameworks. Materialist theories of whiteness combine structural and institutional factors which structure racial hierarchies. This is very Marxist. That is, theorists argue that the consequences of racism are more than discursive or psychological, but result in inequities, economic, political, and educational across racial lines. And then they talk about harms, as they would. And psychological frameworks assume that race identity emerges from a construction of race different race difference that accords privilege and punishment differently to, to people. Bourgeoisie and proletariat racially. White identity theories describe the psychological shifts that whites undergo in moving toward a fully committed form of anti-racism. These theorists suggest the distinct stages uh, that white people pass through in the development of a racialized identity. The material and psychological frameworks are important for understanding the deep-rooted nature of racism in U.S. society and, in particular, educational institutions. However, we argue that the discursive framework is perhaps the most compatible framework for literacy research. Then they, a long section on discourse theories of whiteness and then the significance of this research and so on. Okay, so I believe, though, my purpose was not to highlight the entirety of this paper or all of the nonsense about whiteness and CRT. It was, A, to show that here we have a paper, research. Uh, reading research quarterly 
from 2006, talking about critical race theory in second grade classrooms in schools in Missouri, famously, uh, famously progressive state of Missouri. And we have, um, by 2006, 16 years ago, them not only talking about critical race theory in schools, but saying that it's there, it's important. Second grade classrooms in their literacy reading that reproduce, so that's one point, CRT in schools, whiteness studies in schools, et cetera. Whiteness studies is actually just the, um, this is the other half of, uh, of, uh, of CRT. It is critical race theory applied to the white racial identity rather than racial identities overall. And so, uh, very specifically, and it's the point is to awaken within that racial bourgeoisie, the consciousness of their bourgeois status so that they'll want to abolish it. That's what whiteness studies is actually for. Uh, it's Marxist. And it's like where Marxists would have targeted the bourgeoisie to make them feel guilty so that they would support socialist aims. That's ultimately all it's for. And so that was goal number one, achieved, unambiguous, undeniable. But goal number two is to say that this is just a repackaging of Paulo Freire. And so here by 2006, we see the package, repackaging of Freire into racial terms, into race Marxism terms, the fusion, the hammering together of race Marxism and education Marxism into one thing culturally relevant teaching, multicultural education, ethnic studies has a billion names that it goes by. And all you see, sentence after sentence after sentence after sentence, is Freire's core ideas being reproduced. When Freire's ideas, as I keep mentioning, just reproduce George Lukács' ideas, and George Lukács' ideas just reproduce Marx's ideas, kind of in slightly different contexts. And so just a short little uh, diversion from our exploration directly of Paolo Freire and his book, uh, The Politics of Education, which is one of at least two, but maybe three Freire books we'll go through here on the New Discourses podcast critical education series to convince you that what I'm telling you is true. What we're seeing in education today, especially with race, sex, gender, etc., all of these identity Marxist theories, whether it's race Marxism, gender Marxism, sex Marxism, sexuality Marxism, disability or ability Marxism, fat Marxism, uh, national origin Marxism and post-colonial theory, climate Marxism and climate justice. Uh, I always neglect to mention that we have vaccine Marxism really in a sense um, with the, your so-called clean and unclean people, masked and unmasked people, etc. All of this, all of this at least with the identity politics stuff, maybe not so much with the, the last couple. They're just reproductions of Marxism. That's true. But all of the identity Marxist stuff has just been reproduced in the context of education. Social emotional learning, as you heard, they're using the relevance of psychology because neo-Marxists fused Freud and therefore psychological theories. Uh, also sociology like Weber, Max Weber, his uh, sociological theories. But we're really looking at Freud. We're looking at psychologists like Eric Fromm, who were in the Frankfurt School who brought in tons of uh, psychological bearing onto this. And now it's being brought into ideas like racial trauma. It's just being repackaged. I guarantee you, if we dig into racial trauma, blah, 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 in the CRT way, we're going to find out that it just repackages some garbage that probably Eric Fromm wrote or that Herbert Marcuse wrote or something like this. I, I guarantee you we're, we would find this out. And so I haven't done that work yet, but I bet you, I would bet you dollars to donuts. However, we're supposed to say it donuts. I guess it's like a bad trade now because of inflation, but um, super inflation. I think donuts are way more than a dollar now. Uh, but anyway, maybe it should be, I'm going to bet you donuts to dollars um, that, that what we would find is a direct repackaging there. And so what I'm saying though is Paulo Freire's education has been repackaged into Marxist theories. Social emotional learning is kind of the, I still think it's not best to say social emotional learning is um, a reproduction of critical race theory or the new branding of critical race theory. It's not. It's the hypodermic needle and that's injecting into people all these identity identity Marxist theories based and couched into the Freirean model. And like I've kind of revealed as we were reading through chapter five of the politics of education, where Freire says that the educator's job and the social worker's job are largely the same thing, which is to raise social literacy to replace actual literacy with social political, aka Marxist literacy, aka critical consciousness or awakening a Marxist consciousness in their charges, in this case, children. So it's dragging social work into education, making education into social work. As a matter of fact, that social emotional learning, just like the hypodermic needle, it's injecting all of this Marxist poison into your kids. Social emotional learning is a vehicle. It's also cult indoctrination, the way that they're doing it. 
So induce vulnerability, uh, tell people a way out of that feeling of vulnerability by giving them cult doctrine. Aren't you uncomfortable about your race? Aren't you uncomfortable about your sex or gender? Isn't it how weird how your body's changing? Isn't it weird how people have all these racism issues and people are fighting over things? Isn't it weird about don't say gay or do say gay or whatever, say gay? Isn't this all uncomfortable? Well, guess what? Here's the right answer. This is how you should feel about it. And if you feel this way, you're going to feel better and you're going to get out of the problem. And you can actually take up activism and do something about it. Cult indoctrination 101. Create vulnerability. It's very simple. Create, manufacture, exploit, and amplify feeling of vulnerability. Use cult doctrine to resolve that feeling of vulnerability, especially when there's something to do. For example, another example, just to throw one out there. Oh my God, there's a really bad virus. Aren't you scared? Don't you feel vulnerable? If you wear a mask and wash all of your vegetables when you bring them home, then you can mitigate the spread. And so you need to do this. And if you take a vaccine, then you won't kill grandma and you won't be able to spread. And then you give somebody things to do that create a sense of commitment because they're going to have cognitive dissonance when they figure out it doesn't work to have to explain why they participated in what amounted to a rain dance and that makes them look stupid. And so they're not going to do it. They will rationalize around that to avoid feeling dumb. And this is what being manipulated. It's cult indoctrination 101, whether it's with masks, whether it's with cleaning surfaces, whether it's with vaccines, whether it's with social emotional learning, transformative, specifically social emotional learning with kids and social and cultural situations, which they've now, following Paulo Freire, made education be all about because education has to be Marxist generative, according to Freire, to raise critical consciousness instead of about making people functional, educating them to participate in the existing society, which they want to destroy and tear down. That simple. So we hear in this paper, though, Again, from 2006, talking about putting critical race theory and whiteness studies into second grade reading classrooms, uh, we we hear very explicitly uh, that the Freirean model is being reproduced in the identity Marxist ways, and that we all go to Paulo Freire schools, even though it's talking about identity Marxism now. This is what's happening. This is a newer paper. Like I said, 2006, this isn't remote back in the 70s or the 80s. This is what's set the stage for education in the last 15 to 16 years in this country and going forward. And this is why your kids all go to Paulo Freire schools, because these obsessives have created, with their absolute lack of creativity, recreated the Marxist framework into your education system in a way where very smart, educated people literally can't see it, which blows my mind. But we talked about that too. So I will catch you next time with two more exciting episodes of Paulo Freire's Politics of Education going through chapter six in tremendous detail. It will blow your mind. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you there. So talk soon. <laughs>